And Sharon, are we going to see if people are here or what? I can see that two have arrived. Okay. So okay, I'm good. I see. Yeah. So that see, would be the attendees. But they're not they we're not seeing their pictures at all. No, this is a webinar, not a meeting. Okay. All right, great. Okay, so we'll just give it a few minutes. Welcome everyone if you've joined us. Thanks for being here today, we're going to give uh, everyone a chance to get into the room and then we will get started in just a minute or two. You can go ahead and just say where you're from. I know we have people from different parts of the country, um, uh, a number from Arizona, but one from Kentucky, Alaska, New Jersey, North Carolina, Texas, um, Ontario, Toronto, and uh, Pakistan, Karachi. Yeah, I think I saw someone in there from Jamaica and um, Jamaica. Yes, yeah, that's right. So Kingston, that's right. California. I'm not sure I mentioned California. So glad to have you. And we'll just give it another minute or two. It's always fun to celebrate new books. And we're lucky that we have two debut authors. And there's Sarah from Gilbert, <laughs> just uh, a few miles from my house. So that's great. Kathy from North Carolina. Hi, Kathy. Shazia from Arizona. Welcome everyone. So what do you think, Laura? Shall we get started? Sure. Um, yeah, let's go are... ahead and get started. Oh, Fred from San Francisco. Welcome, Fred. So we are so pleased to welcome you to, it's our what, third maybe or fourth? Fourth, I think this is our fourth, yeah. Um, showcase of our authors and local authors and illustrators. And we love to do this as a way to, um, number one, learn more about our local authors' books, but also uh, to give our community a chance to ask them questions, um, learn more about you know, their journey to publication and their own experiences, because it's, as we know, it's different for everyone. So um, a few housekeeping things. Um, if you, we'll, we will save time at the end, 10 minutes at the end for questions. So as the questions come to you, if you could just drop them in the chat, but start them with two question marks so that we can scan the chat quickly and grab those questions um, easily. And then we'll get to those at the end. And, um, Let's see, I will also be dropping links in to purchase our author's books. And I'll several times. We hope you will support them and our local indie bookstore and um, Southwest Human Development. So uh, with that, uh, I believe that's it, right, Laura? Um, Laura, yep. uh, you wanna... Laura, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, then? <laughs> I was just gonna say that too. Um, my name's Laura Ellen, and I am um, the novel half of the PAL coordinator for SCBWI AZ. I'm a YA author. And I'm Diane White, and I'm the picture book half of the PAL coordinator. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so um, we're, we're glad to have you all here. And we're going to begin with, well, we first, let's say we have Aiden Palidoros. I hope I said that right. And Harshida Giraffe, is that right? And BG Hennessy with us today. And we're so excited that they're going to share a little bit about their books. And we're gonna start with BG. She'll introduce herself, um, probably share her book and maybe a little bit more and then we'll get to our question and go to the next two and so on. So go ahead, BG, welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. 
Um, I, I'm not quite, I'm usually in Arizona, but I'm talking to you from Florida today. I'm, we're visiting family and um, I am, which is different for me because usually I am in Arizona. I am the author of 40 picture books and my newest book is just coming out and it's called, I have to get everything. I'm not sure if you could see this backwards yeah. probably, but yeah. it's- No, it's this, good. Yeah, this little farmer went to market and I've always loved farmer's markets. I travel a lot. And in fact, I was at a farmer's market this morning in St. Petersburg. And I find for me, a lot of my books, my ideas for books come from experiences I have. A lot of times traveling, but also just day-to-day -day things that happen to me when my, I have three sons who are now grown. I'm visiting my granddaughters to give you an idea of how grown they are. But um, I find that the children's books and the ideas I get from them often come from something that I've experienced myself or with children. And you see things through sort of a different eye. That's sort of the idea a lot of times for a lot of the books that I've done. Um, I, all my books are picture books and you may know um, a number of them. I think I've done about 16 of my books are based on Corduroy Bear, which was written by Don Freeman, the first Corduroy and then Pocket for Corduroy. Um, when he wrote Pocket for Corduroy, I was the art director at Viking Children's Books at that time. I had a, I worked in children's book publishing for, all, for about 17, 18 years and a great about 13, 14 years of that was at Viking. And I, maybe I'll talk about that a little more later in my path to publication because it really was different probably for most people. Um, I love books that explore a topic from a very, from a question point of view very often. And when I'm working on it, whether it's, you know, a farmer's market book, um, I've done a book on road construction. It's, um, I try and ask the question that I think a child would ask. Um, why does it take so many trucks to build a road? Or, and, and with the farmer's market book, it was not so much that children asked the question, where does the food come from? Because they, it comes from the grocery store for most of them. But I wanted them to think beyond that. So um, what I did, and I've, I've done this in other books where I start with a familiar song, rhyme, um, character, something like that, and take it in a different direction. And this one, the, the rhyme, this little piggy goes to market is where this started from. But in this case, it goes, this little farmer went to market. You see them leaving in the truck. That little farmer goes too. This little farmer, has, this farmer family has one stand. That farmer family has two. And this little farmer, works on his farm all day long. And it goes back and forth for a while from farmers markets to different kinds of farms where some are um, for crops, some are for animals, lots and lots of different foods, which I find um, young children are ident starting to identify. My 21 month old granddaughter told me that she wanted that avocado yesterday. So they really are trying to learn things very easily. And then it breaks, in, the rhyme breaks into um, plant the seeds row by row, day by day, they sprout and grow. And then it shows a community garden. So it, it covers rural, suburban, urban, this is one of my favorite spreads. Let's see if I can get it. Um, parsley, rhubarb, pumpkin vines, carrots, turnips, harvest time. And then there's more. Uh, Marianne Fraser did the illustrations. 
and Michael Hale, SCBWI buddy, did the design, which is lovely. And then it says, this little shopper went to market. That little shopper went to. This little shopper filled one bag. That little shopper filled two. And these little shoppers said, mm, 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 all the way home. <laughs> um, very young. Um, and then the last two pages, I've done this in a couple of my books where I have their hidden, hidden pictures, there's information about farms, farm facts, farmer's tools. And then there's going to be a web a page. Uh, Southwest Human Development is going to have a page online for links to things like the edible schoolyard and a lot of this farm to table um, gardening and eating. So. Um, that's kind of a good overview, I think, of an appro approach I take for a lot of my picture books. So awesome. Thank I'll you. Turn it over. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, BG. That was wonderful. We can't wait to learn more about um, the process of producing that book and then, you know, your journey going way back with starting with Corduroy. Yeah. So, wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Harshita, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We uh, are excited to learn about your debut. And Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm excited to be here too. I'm really honored. Thank you. Uh, my book is called The Leaping Ladu. I'm going to share screen so that you can get a good view. Okay. Uh, my book just came out uh, in March. So as you can see, I'm really, really new. It's called The Leaping Ladu. And uh, 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 the idea of this book came to me while I was making ladus for my son's birthday. That was like about uh, five years ago, I would say. And uh, But the inspiration came to me, uh, I think a lot, uh, it, uh, older, uh, I mean, many years, many, many years ago, uh, when I used to travel to India, and that is uh, 20 plus hours of flight taking them there. So there were no picture books at that time that would introduce my children to uh, the India I wanted them to introduce to. So what I would do is I would verbally paint a picture about streets of India. Like as soon as you get out of the airport, you're gonna uh, see lazing cows, basically the sights, sounds, and the smell of India, because it is so different from here. Like I read in parenting books, that's the best thing to do, to acclimatize, like just introduce the, your kids uh, early before you even go to that place. So I think the, uh, now that I see my book, I'm able to relate that the inspiration was uh, really, that was my inspiration, the long travel that I used to do with children. And uh, the concept uh, is very simple, like I said, to introduce streets of India to children. And I thought the, the gingerbread bread man story provided a very good platform where I could do this. So this is a cult, cultural take on the gingerbread man story. So, okay, going on the next. So what is a ladu? I wanted to show that. It is an Indian desert round in shape and generally shaped by hands like you see in this particular Jeff. This is the cover page. You can also see it in the background. I have it here uh, for the book. This is the little ladu or a big ladu <laughs> running away. <laughs> and uh, these are some of my favorite spreads from the book. This in particular, I like it because it pretty much conveys all, all the essential elements of the Indian streets uh, that, that are quite different than what you see here. The vibrant uh, colors, mom and pop shops, uh, cycle rickshaws, lazing cows. So even though the illustrator and author don't talk uh, during uh, the picture book making, but uh, here in this case, uh, my illustrator Kamala Nair, she's from India itself. And she's done a beautiful job. We didn't talk, but uh, the elements that I wanted uh, to show, they all have come across beautifully. And uh, I can read this to you. But the Ladu sprinted to the street and sped past honking cars, squeaking rickshaws and lazing cows to a corner where kids were playing cricket. 
cricket is a game which is also very essential to india so with this book i want uh, to introduce few elements uh, otherwise which are unknown to people and people who are familiar uh, with the they, i my hope is those readers find comfort in this uh, in these pictures when they see themselves then this is also my favorite this is uh, an indian wedding it's uh, the procession the, the groom procession is called a barat so which is on the streets uh, the groom rides on a horse or elephant or or a car anything the laddu barrel through the barat where the band went dum dum my bride loves laddus the groom thought stop laddu he shouted come with me to enjoy the bridal reception i'm too smart to be lord and the laddu ran, ran away singing bago bago as fast as you can you can't eat me i'm the laddu man so this is the refrain uh, uh, i had a very hard time on the refrain i uh, i wanted to introduce some hindi words so kids can play with the language as well and i uh, worked and reworked revised this refrain plenty of time going back to the original uh, one simpler i think simplest is the best where kids could uh, kids can say it read aloud and uh, they're able to catch some new words so this is it and i think we can talk about challenges later on so that's me and my book in nutshell thank you so much that was wonderful glad to see those illustrations and uh, we can't wait to learn more about your journey to publication as a debut and now aiden has a ya and he is going to be talking and sharing a little bit about that hi yeah um my young adult novel came out back in October, The City Beautiful. It's a um, queer historical fantasy young, uh, YA novel set during the 1893 World's Fair. It centers um, Jewish uh, immigrants to the United States, um, namely um, the main character, uh, Altair. He's a 17-year-old immigrant from Romania. He came over several year, years back, um, and uh, this book uh, focuses on him. And uh, it's about um, a series of dis disappearances uh, of young uh, Jewish men in the city at the time. And when his uh, roommate becomes the latest person to disappear, and then his, his body is discovered at the fair, um, Altair becomes determined to find the person responsible. It also utilizes uh, Jewish folklore in the uh, element of the Dybbuk, which is a possessive spirit in, um, in Jewish folklore. And uh, Altair's roommate, uh, Yaakov, uh, basically possesses him and his spirit and his desire for revenge is what drives uh, Altair through the book um, all across Chicago into um, like, for example, the Levy, the red light district and into the more um, affluent neighborhoods as well. Um, this was not the first story I wrote, but I would definitely say that it was the most personal and the one where I um, put in the most of myself. Both, and. It was also, I'd say, probably one of the more difficult stories to write because um, it being a historical fantasy novel, one that's very um, deeply meshed in the actual events that were occurring during that time, I wanted to stick very close to the actual timeline. Um, it's set between the 4th of July and um, then a disastrous fire that occurred on July 11th um, at the fairgrounds in real life. And um, so it was very interesting for me to sort of try to um, fit the book between those two events. Um, what I also um, found to be interesting in writing this book was also utilizing Yiddish and Hebrew and trying to do it in a way that um, that made sense for the protagonist, those being his first languages. 
I didn't want to rely too much on uh, explaining what these words mean to the readers. I wanted to come across very naturally and organically. And um, so throughout the book, he references words. I do, and um, I don't necessarily spend too much time explaining this is what this word means, this is what this does, this is um, why he's doing these things. I think that, um, I think that, especially for young, a young adult audience, that's not necessary. And I feel that if young adult readers can jump into a secondary world fantasy book and learn all these new terms and learn um, these magical words that authors made up, there is no reason that they can't figure out what these words mean from context or look at the glossary in the back, or at the very least, um, oh, sorry, at, at worst case scenario, um, look at them up on their phones. Um, so yeah, this was um, a very enjoyable book to write. Um, and at first I was also very nervous about, um, about it because I felt as though it was too Jewish to be marketed as a queer novel to, and then too queer to be marketed as a Jewish novel, um, especially in that the protagonist is observant. Um, and I feel like a lot of the exposure young adults get to uh, religious characters in fiction, namely um, queer characters who come from religious families, it, um, it portrays uh, faith and queerness as not being uh, able to, not as unreconcilable, sorry, irreconcilable. And um, I wanted to avoid that in this book. So um, that was also on my mind as I was working and as it was uh, going on submission, um, that it was also something I worried about. Um, this, yeah, I think, uh, that's a lot of what I was planning to say. It's not my first book um, either, but it's my first one with a big five um, publisher. The others um, were with a smaller publisher uh, called Entangled and eventually um, the rights got reverted back to me. So I took those books off my website. Um, I may eventually return to them in the future and try to rewrite them and resell them, but um, in many ways, I like to think of The City Beautiful as being my first book, um, just because the experience as well that I've had um, with uh, Inkyard Press has been uh, very different compared to my experience with the former publisher. Fascinating. Wow. Plus, shall we mention your award? Yeah, um, The City Beautiful also won uh, the Sydney Taylor Book Award. It's a major Jewish award for, um, mm -hmm. yeah. for, uh, for, yeah, children's books. It was a very, very um, great news for me. I, I felt so honored because, as I mentioned before, I felt that this book um, was too queer to really be considered a Jewish book. Um, and recently it was also nominated for the... Uh, young adult fiction category in the Lambda Awards, which is um, a major uh, LGBT award. So um, that's also been very, um, very rewarding. Wow. Hi. We have set, we're so glad that you're all here because we're going to hear so many different kinds of book experiences. Um, so Laura, I think you're going to start with the first question. Sure. I will start it off. And so, um, all three of you kind of touched on on how you um, came up with the concept and uh, Aiden, you kind of touched on a little bit of um, their challenges that you had. So I thought we could just kind of delve in a little bit deeper. And um, if you could you know, each speak to in uh, specifically this book and how um, the the publishing process, if you're published before um, or, you know, any other kind of challenges that you you faced, you know, we always as authors and illustrators, we always have this concept in mind, and then um, that final that final project when it gets published is not exactly what we had in mind. So, if you can speak to any kind of things like that that um, that you had to give up in your concept or any other challenges that you faced 
And um, I guess we'll start with um, Aiden, if you want to start, and then um, we'll go to um, Harshita and then BG. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say um, this book definitely um, went through a lot of changes from the first draft to the, the version that was published. Um, I actually heavily revised the first version with my previous agent, um, rewrote a good half of the book. Um, and then my agent and I decided to part ways because um, she, I think she wasn't she wasn't a good fit for this book. It was um, too dark for her. Um, and um, so I queried it I, and uh, found an agent pretty quickly for it. Um, but I feel like if I, I feel like it could have been very discouraging and I could have just put the book aside and um, it would have never gone out then. Um, the pro whole process after that for revisions was um, minor in comparison. I mean, I took it from 65,000 words to 105, I believe, in revisions, which is a ton, but um, but a lot of it was um, building upon character relationships, um, expanding upon a subplot and tying in red herrings a bit more. Um, I'd say that the main thing that I had to change uh, was the fact that in the previous versions, uh, Altair, um, there is more of a romantic subplot between Altair and Yaakov's uh, Dybbuk um, and more attraction there. And uh, my editor wanted me to focus more on the relationship he has with the love interest, Frankie, um, who's still obviously still alive. Um, so that was, I'd say, probably the, mo the most significant change I made um, and something I still have mixed feelings about. But I do think that as far as um, a craft standpoint goes, it's helpful in that it allows the romance and the reader's focus to be more heavy, heavily uh, focused on Frankie and Altair's relationship. Interesting. Yeah. Harshida? Yeah, for me, uh, it, it's my debut. So uh, some of the challenges started during the querying process itself. I received a lot of rejections from the agents. So uh, some of them were like food item is very difficult to illustrate. Some reasons I'm giving you, the one that I was rejected, like the story got rejected for that food item is difficult to illustrate. Then uh, there were one that uh, uh, said that they're not supporting, they're not right now not taking author, uh, author only for picture books. They would prefer author illustrator or someone who uh, has both picture book as well as uh, bigger books in their portfolio, like chapter books uh, or middle grade. or So those were all kinds of rejection I'd been getting for uh, this book. So once I found my agent, um, uh, Albert Whitman is, by the way, the publisher for this book. So it has been an awesome experience with them. Awesome. It's my first book. So I've heard, but I've heard a lot of horror stories from different people. So uh, it's uh, my acquiring editor left the company as soon as we signed the contract. So I was really terrified. I was like, uh, I've, I heard so many stories that uh, the stories get dropped. It never happens. But Albert Whitman, uh, nothing like that happened. Another editor took over the editing process it was not much because the yeah, probably because it's a picture book or probably because the storyline was pretty uh, simple. We did have some few edits back and forth, but that's about it. Then um, in between, there was a time when there were no editor. The second editor also left. And then mm -hmm. our third editor. But throughout, the process was seamless for me. So I didn't face any of those challenges that I heard. Uh, I was afraid, but nothing like that happened. And uh, uh, we, uh, we, I saw the initial sketches uh, 
by Kamla Nair, there were some back and forth on it uh, because uh, Kamla is uh, from South India. Uh, if people who know North, South, East, well, they differ quite a bit in their, um, their food, culture, uh, clothing also differs in some ways. So we just did a little back and forth uh, about it and uh, she did an amazing, amazing job. So I didn't face any of those challenges that I feel people face during, even though editors changed, I'm on my third editor, so many things happened and the book came out. So I got all the support I got, uh, I needed from this publisher. So no complaints there. That's great. You know, I should have, um, I'm curious, Aiden, and then um, Harshita, then we'll get to BG, uh, what the, the length of time was from um, the sale of the book um, to publication. And then, you know, maybe it was uh, for Aiden, especially with, did you have to uh, revise be before they bought it or did they buy it? And then how did that work? Yeah. Um... So the um, I didn't have to do any revisions for um, before they bought it. it wasn't to revise and resubmit. Um, I be they um, I I believe um, my editor offered in February, um, and we went over a call. We went over some basic changes uh, she was considering. She wanted to make sure um, her vision for the book meshed with mine. And then um, we sold it in March and it came out, um, it was originally going to come out in September of the next year, but we pushed the uh, the date back to October because um, the publication date fell on um, a major Jewish holiday and there's a lot of holidays in September. So mm -hmm. um, it, we were worried that it would affect the, um, the, the, the way the book was received and um, affect the visibility of the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So about a, a year and a half or so from sale to publication. Yeah, I believe I finished revisions around um, October, I'd say so um, a whole year before yeah. it uh, came out. Okay, and Harshita with your editors leaving two editors leaving. How long was that process? About the same, I would say. I signed the contract in October 2020. The final, all signatures done. That was the month and the book came out now, 1st of March. So a year and a half. Hmm, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And BG, you have a completely different process. Uh, so this is, well, and, and this farmer book was completely different than any other book I've done because um, Southwest Human Development is an organized nonprofit in Arizona that specializes in or uh, oversees many different groups that are dedicated for health of all kinds from zero to 12 years old, I believe it is. And they um, have, a, have a contest. This was just the second one where um, people then they have a very large literacy component to um, their outreach. And they had a contest. You submitted a blind submission. And then they, they chose one book. Um, they chose mine for this particular year. And they did a beautiful job actually putting, putting it together. I was, um, I have never self-published. I've worked in publishing. I know how hard it is to really do a really top level picture book. And they did a beautiful job. Mm -hmm. However, this book was supposed to come out, I think three years ago. <laughs> so I finished my editing. We finished, I finished my part, I would say within you know a month or two. And it has been incredibly long wait. Hmm. And part of it is that they're not a publisher. There was, you know, all the COVID things, the, you know, finding an illustrator um, took them a long time. But, um, and it'll be interesting. I think the marketing is going to be very different because it's not, you know, uh, my other publishers, I published with uh, Viking, Simon & Schuster, Candlewick, and Putnam. 
So I'm used to, very used to um, that method of marketing and how that works. And this is going to be quite, this book will be quite different because I think they're, they're talking to, you know, Sprouts and Home Depot and I don't know who all else because um, they really want to reach, it, reach a broad audience. The other thing that's really great about this is uh, it's like Tom Shoes or Warby Parker. You buy a book and they give a book away. Um, which is really great. And it's, you know, the same, I think it's, well, it's $18, but if you buy it, you get two books, but they give, you know, they give another one away. Um, so they're, they're really a fabulous organization. And I was very, I was happy, you know, especially since it was a blind submission um, that they chose my manuscript. And I'm holding my breath because I said, oh my gosh, you know, somebody else is going to come out with this farmer's market thing before it came out. And there are other books out, but I, I don't, I haven't seen one. Really, it does exactly the same thing. So it'll be interesting to see it. It's publishing, I think, in, in April. So it's, it's available, but it hasn't actually had its opening, opening day yet. So another thing that's very different about publishing, this is the only book they're doing. So it, it doesn't have the same kind of sales force or anything like that. So any publicity, I'm, you know, let's, you know, let's see how far we can reach. But right. very different than um, my other, all my other books. Um, I do have a, you know, I'm, I'm listening to those, that first manuscript story. And at the time I sold my first, I sold my first books. There are two of them that I submitted together. And at the time I was the art director at Viking and I have my, my background is art, book arts, typography all the way at that point. But um, I've been working with children's books by that time, probably for about 10 years, and just had the most interesting, best job in the world. Um, and I had these ideas. One was the dinosaur lived in my backyard, which is still in print. Um, I think it's sold about 700,000 copies now. Um, and the, the other one was, I think I have a copy here, yeah. A, B, C, D, Tummy, Toes, Hands, Knees, which is like a, a word book. It's 87 words. But, and I, I felt I needed to submit it to Viking, but I was very nervous about it because these were my, my coworkers and I didn't want them to feel obligated and I didn't want to be embarrassed. So I ended up you know, typing up the manuscripts and using my grandmother's name on the manuscript and I handed it Nancy Paulson at that time who was uh, biking and I, I gave I went into Nancy's office and I said I'm working with an you know an artist and I her, her art really isn't that good but I kind of like her text I like these two stories she had <laughs> take a look and Anybody who's ever submitted anything to a publisher, even if you work there, you know, you've got at least a month to wait for an answer. So I was so nervous about it. And I went back to my office and about an hour later, Nancy came back in and she said, I love these stories. Who is this author? And I absolutely froze. I, I lied. I said, I have her name somewhere, I'll find it, I'll get it for you. And I was, she said, it's Regina Hayes was the editorial director. And she says, Regina's coming back from her meeting. I'm gonna show these to her right away. And I was, after, I didn't really know what to say. So the next day, I didn't tell them that day. I came in the next day and Regina said, well, did you find, you know, this, right, this author's information? I, I had to say, Yes, I said, I have to tell you, I said, I wrote them. And Regina <laughs> and Nancy are rarely without words, but um, they both 
said, wow, okay. And that's really how the first two, two books came out. Um, I don't have an agent and that's what, you know, I have been off and on for several years trying to find one um, and I haven't yet. And I think right now it's, it is almost impossible um, to, to submit things without an agent. And I wish I had great advice on how to do that. Um, but my stories of how a lot of these books have gotten done are, I, uh, I did a book, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, um, and um, Elizabeth Law had a, she was um, working at Simon and & Schuster, and they had an illustrator who did these great, he wanted to do that story, but he couldn't write it. So I wrote that one and somebody else had a toy animal. And then of course the corduroy books came out another way. And I think my background in design and art direction and really knowing how those books are put together, a lot of my books have come from other different points of contact because I can see a book in many different ways. Um, it's, a, it's a blessing and a curse though. It's hard, you know, because I say, oh, it might be better this way, and I'll go in that direction and go down a rabbit hole. But it's been... wow. That's <laughs> that's really yeah. like I, I didn't realize you had like so many um so many different publishers too. That's that's awesome. So um kind of you kind of touched on it a little bit. So I think let's let's go into um advice that that the three of you would have for. Um, those aspiring authors in in our um, audience, um, Harshita. I know you're you're a debut, but um, I'm sure there's things that maybe you um, have come across along the way that maybe you do differently or that really helped you. So, what would be your top your top um, tips for authors trying to get published? I I think it might sound cliche, but I would say patience. Uh, have a grit. Uh, what I did was I almost was on the verge of giving up with so many rejections. And uh, uh, my husband uh, is a big uh, time supporter. So he's like, at least get 100 rejections and then you go to that. <laughs> so I maintained a spreadsheet that has really helped me. So that is probably you, people already do that. So spreadsheet who will... Uh, wherever I, I submit it and if it is the uh, positive which happened only with the one agent after all but if it is rejection everything in red and waiting is in yellow and uh, of course uh, good green is uh, acceptance so that really helped me to manage everything wherever I was submitting and you have to put yourself out there uh, so I did a lot of different things, not just uh, the regular querying process. I was I found my agent through Twitter pitch. So I tried that as well. Then I attended conferences and uh, connected with people there. It was very, very hard for me to do that. Uh, I'm sure it is for a lot of other introverts and no. Uh, so, but anyways, you have to put yourself out there. Don't, don't hesitate. Even if you hesitate, still do it. And uh, thirdly, I would say, write the story you want to write because then uh, you would write it best based on whatever your heart is saying. Don't uh, uh, skew it to the fads or to the audience liking. So those are the three things I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Those are those are some really great ones. Um, Aiden, how about you? Yeah, I would second the um, maintain a spreadsheet um, comment because uh, for me that was also essential. And uh, when I was querying, um, I'm actually on my third agent now. My first agent um, left the industry. Um, this was before I wrote the City Beautiful, um, and I actually began querying. Um, the book that would uh, be become Bone Weaver, which is my book coming out um, this uh, sept September, um, as, and that's how I found my second agent. Um, but that book died on submission, so um, it eventually 
it was picked up. But um, for me, I think that um, one of the most important pieces of advice I would give is um, don't uh, don't allow rejection to influence the way you view your own work or the value of your writing. Um, I think it's very easy to let it get to your head. And if you get rejections to think, I'm a bad writer, um, this book's not bad. It's, um, it's funny because Bone Weaver sold in virtually the same, um, it was the same manuscript that got rejected during a time when the young adult fantasy market was oversaturated. Um, so I think market plays such a huge role in which books get picked up. And I think it's very easy to lose sight of that when you're querying or when you're on submission. Um, I know for me, before The City Beautiful, I would tr try to chase markets um, in hopes that the book would sell um, in hopes that that would pave the way to write the kind of fiction I wanted to write, which was um, queer, um, dark horror. Um, so my first two books that sold uh, Project Pandora and Project Prometheus, they both had straight protagonists. They both were rather, um, I, I'd, say, I'd say they they were um, a bit flat in that um, I felt as though I was trying to write for the market. And I think that my writing was able to shine a lot more when I was writing for myself, for the kind of um, t uh, teen that I was, and trying to write the kind of book that I wish I had back then. Um, See, so yeah, I'd say that uh, determination and perseverance that is very important in, in this industry and in um, not giving up in realizing that rejection is just a natural part of the publishing process and you're going to get rejections every step of the way and you're going to see friends of yours, critique partners, um, go um, get that agent or get the publish or get a nomination, et cetera. And that's gonna be discouraging and that's something you're going to have to accept as a writer. Um, my other advice, uh, which has already been said, is um, I would definitely utilize pitch contests. Um, I found my first two agents through pitch contests. Um, and I think that they can be a very useful way in getting your work out there and, and sort of uh, bypassing the slush pile. Um, of course, always do your research. But um, yeah, I, I'd say that. And lastly, it just. Um, don't submit a book until you're absolutely sure it's ready. Um, I made that mistake early on in submitting projects that could have used um, more editing. And there's no um, there's no positive in doing that. I feel it's most important to just get the book revised and in the best possible shape. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's all really, really good. Um, advice, especially because being a writer, it's you're so isolated. And so it's so easy to be like, when you get so many rejections, you're just like, oh, I suck, you know? So it's it's good to remind um, authors of that. And BG, how about you having sat on both sides of, you know, being an um, author and also having been in the, the publisher, um, what would you say your top tips for uh, aspiring authors and illustrators would be? Well, as for picture books, I would say um, there's several things. One, I, I, I tend certainly to work on several things, maybe not at exactly the same time, but I, I don't work just on one thing and say, this is the only book I'm going to work on. I find that um, there may be, I have a list of titles, of characters, of places, of topics, and they kind of percolate as I go, you know, um, over time. And it's odd, they, they start meshing at a certain point. You'll pick some, a character from one thing and says, oh, that would be a good character for a certain topic. Um, for me, for picture books, um, play with your idea. Don't be afraid to 
um, change it up. I've taken some, you know, an idea that I really like and say, it's just not, there's a big hole in the middle of it. Um, and I'll rhyme it and then, I'll, or I'll unrhyme it, or I'll try it from a whole different perspective. So I think playing with it, I think part of my background as an art director was to um, read a manuscript that had been accepted and find the right illustrator. And the really great manuscripts could have any number of wonderful illustrators to them because they had so many possibilities. So in picture books, you are trying to use every single word, the right word, but you're also trying to think about the illustrator and how to give them something to work with that's going to make it as, even more unique. Um, also with picture books, I would say reading them out loud is critical. Um, it will, it, you'll really hear where things just start getting too, too long, too flat or too forced. Um, so that I do a lot of that um, reading out loud, trying things out, um, really going to bookstores and libraries, um, I think is see what else. Libraries are great because they'll show you over time. A bookstore is generally a lot of um, series right now. <laughs> and then depending on the bookstore, um, and then some very new things. It doesn't quite give you, you may not find something that you think, well, this is really like what I'm doing. I think, um, you know, I've been an SCBWI member forever. Um, and I think the conferences, um, the um, workshops have been very helpful. I, I think um, the, I'm really fascinated by the pitch contest, which I have not done. I think that would be really interesting. I know that um, I think writing for me, I'm probably you know the, the most reluctant writer because my background really is not in writing. I think of myself really more as a bookmaker and I'll see, well, this would be a good book and I, I will think of, well, what would be a good text if I wanted to do, you know, that kind of a book. So um, it's a sort of different way. I, I'll dummy things out, I pace things out. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to work at a story sometimes. Um, it's, I think it's part of the reason why I often will start with a nursery rhyme or an idea and then take it off because it kind of gives me a little foundation to work off from. And I find children do like knowing something. <laughs> they don't know, and, you know, it's, um, I, would, I love the gingerbread uh, reference they, to um, the letter book because kids will get that. They really understand it and, um, but they'll also learn something. They have something to attach that information to, which makes it fun. I think having a, um, you know, a group or even a couple of people who read your things and give you feedback is, is very helpful as well. But a little bit of everything. <laughs> nice, thank you. Diane, did you wanna uh, ask another sure. question? Um, yeah, oh. you, you've kind of touched on it a little bit. I love the advice of um, kind of, you know, this is the way the business is. There's a lot of rejection. Um, it is part of the process. And so you sort of have to um, steal yourself for that and just and not get down on yourself. But it made me wonder what your, um, do you have uh, a critique group? Do you have friends? Like what are the things that, because writing is so solitary, how do you remind yourself of, you know, some like the advice that Aiden was giving of, you know, this, this is, you, you know, there are there's a time for this book and maybe it might have to sit, but, you know, it helps to have a friend or two who can 
confirm that for you. So uh, do you guys have writing groups uh, or, um, you know, are there classes, you know, what kind of, where do you feed, how do you feed your writing life? So maybe we'll start with Aiden. Yeah, um, well, to answer the first part about, um, before I forget, um, for me, what's been very helpful and reassuring me that my writing isn't terrible when I feel that way is um, I like to hold on to, when I was querying personalized um, rejections or rejections that praised my work, um, and um, I kept a file of those. Now I keep a file of good reviews and um, trade reviews um, to remind myself that, you know, um, even just have, um, even just pe comments people have made to me over Twitter about what they like about my book um, or how they feel seen and represented, um, those have all been very encouraging. For a, a critique group, um, yeah, I do have um, multiple critique partners. Um, I have uh, two of them that I've been exchanging work with since um, since when I first started querying um, Project Pandora. So like um, back in th 2016, um, I have uh, those um, two. And I also um, oftentimes find other critique partners um, for me, it was very important while working on The City Beautiful to find uh, critique partners who were uh, Jewish and who were observant because um, I'm not observant. So I was coming at it from um, out, outside that perspective. Um, I also, um, like with um, Bone Weaver as well, um, which is heavily based on, uh, on Slavic folklore and on the... Um, fall of the Romanov dynasty, I also made sure to find critique partners who, um, and sensitive readers who were um, Russian or who spoke Russian, who could give me, um, who could make sure that I was not writing anything offensive or that, um, who could point out places where my own knowledge and research fell short. Um, I think for me, that was very important. Um, and something that I'll continue to um, to do in my writing because um, I, it helped me find blind spots. It helped me also um, produce the best um, work possible. I, and I think that's especially important um, in the querying phase to find um, critique partners who can lend insight into parts of your book that um, you don't have personal experience in or who can um, help you just make it the best work possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Harshida? Yeah, I'm also part of a couple of uh, critique groups and uh, they're like my lifeline, I, I'll say. They're so important. Uh, uh, we work as a team. We have a timeline, uh, fixed timelines when we are, um, both the groups are online for me. So we uh, put our uh, work in a shared drive and we have to get back. And uh, over a period of time, uh, we have developed an understanding. Like there are certain times when uh, someone uh, needs the work to be urgently uh, reviewed and like, hey, whoever is available, just quickly review that. So it's we've become like a team, and I would highly recommend it to uh, writers to have that because what happens is when we are writing a story, we become, I feel, too engrossed. Like we are completely inside the story and we lose a perspective. So we need people who are outside of the story who have the distance and who are able to see, like Aiden said, blind spots and things. So for me, uh, people uh, who are not from the same culture. That's so amazing, right? Because uh, this, these books are for everybody. So they give me a perspective. Oh, I can understand this. Or so I know that where things are going wrong or what I need to improve. So I would highly recommend uh, it. It's, I can't uh, imagine uh, doing this all alone. 
So it's a group project, even though I'm the author, but uh, behind this book, there are so, so many people, so many people. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And BG? Well, I, you know, I think you've, you've all heard how helpful groups are, you know, even if it's one or two friends or, um, you know, I find school librarians, um, public librarians, teachers, sometimes if, I, if I'm doing a book, I'm not sure if the age perhaps is right or, you know, how this is, because curriculum has changed so much over the last you know, really 15 years, it's sort of try to figure out, okay, because the picture book age has dropped quite a bit since, I mean, the corduroy books, for example, if you did a reading level on corduroy, it comes out at like third grade at this point. Um, it's, so you have to really be careful um, and it's okay to have some books that, or a book that has older words in it, but you need to kind of be aware of some of that. So I will often, I will often try that. Um, I find for me, um, as far as working goes, I have, um, because I'm traveling now, I pick a couple, I have little notebooks that I bring that are simply like one idea or one group idea. So I'll have, and I just, I make notes, I do, let's see, you know, I'll have pictures, I do all articles, because I just, sometimes it's good to sort of step out of things. I would say a number of my books, I've got the ideas when, I'm, when I am traveling when I am away, when I'm stepping out of my office. And um, that I, you know, I'll try and bring, um, I bring my little notebooks. I have a, um, on my phone, I have a note, it's just book ideas. And I can just, if I'm out driving or if I'm out somewhere, I Sometimes you say, I had a good idea today. I wonder what it was, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember that. that I had it, but what the heck was it? Um, <laughs> so I try and, you know, just make a lot of, make little notes and then I'll try and combine them. I find there are a fair amount of um, good online resources for very specific things. I've taken some of the, I think it's writing blueprints, things on, you know, at working with editors or marketing, or I take Skillshare is another, you know, sometimes doing something that's totally out of the writing realm. Um, and they have things on how to make a handmade book or things like that, that just, it's related sort of, but it helps me um, step away a little bit because mm -hmm. getting there's a there's a hard line between okay the best I can do and because it's always could be better you know there always could be another edit and saying okay you just got to send this or you just have to move on from this so um, you know I find sometimes stepping away from something and then coming back and um, I've, I've enjoyed some of those times that I've done that. And then I come back and I say, you know what, this, this is a good story, but this character is not, it's not full enough. I have to figure out something else. And um, timing, uh, you know, timing, patience, I think are both, and grit. I like all the things that people have mentioned. Um, even with some of my books that have gone into um, paperback or different editions um, or books that kind of struggle to find their audience, sometimes it's just timing. And if the publisher has patience, I mean, they've been, it's been great. And sometimes, you know, the market just doesn't find the book. So, um, you know, it happens. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so, and we've talked about some of this. Uh, one of the questions is, what is your writing process like? How do you go about it? So I take that to be maybe um, 
you know, do you sit down at your desk a certain amount of time each day and, um, or do you have a kind of set routine or a, a way of approaching your work? Um, some of you have touched on that a little bit, but um, Harshita, do you wanna yeah. start? Yeah, um, for me, uh, like uh, BG mentioned, it all starts with ideas. She has ideas book, right? I have uh, books everywhere, like the Ladu idea came to me in kitchen. So I have a kitchen notepad. Most of uh, the time for me, the ideas come to me while I'm cooking. Probably I'm in that state of mind. And then, uh, so I always uh, keep noting my ideas. So anytime I have, uh, I'm, the inspiration comes and then I'm compelled to write. Right? I have to write. There's nothing else. I have to just write that story. It, nothing can stop me. And then I just sit and write. Uh, I have a more flexible schedule because uh, I'm stay at home right now. So once uh, I send the kids off to school, I have to do my um, uh, everyday uh, chores and then I can uh, I, with a cup of chai I sit and uh, write down and I have to finish that story whatever it is it's like a inspiration spurt and I have to get it out of my mind so yeah a few hours before I then go and pick up my kids so that's the routine I have and then uh, meeting with my critique partners uh, that ha that is on a regular schedule mm -hmm. and uh, and then revision, which uh, I don't like much, but <laughs> it needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. So that's when I, whenever every day after dropping the kids, when I sit. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. And how about you, Aiden? Yeah, I find for myself that with each book, it's a bit different. Um, for my earlier books, I was in college at the time and writing was sort of um, an outlet and something I really enjoyed doing, something I admittedly did a lot in class. Um, and then when, <laughs> when uh, I graduated, it changed a, a ton. Um, it became very hard for me to write actually. Um, recently, I started dictating, I feel most of, um, I'd say that the, in the last year, the majority of what I've what I've written has actually first been dictated using um, Dragon. Um, while I'm working on um, my sort of a second job, which is running a e-commerce store. Um, so I, yeah, I found that dictating for me has been most helpful. Um, then just um, also exchanging work with critique partners as a way of um, holding myself liable. Um, I, it's been more difficult having to create my own um, sort of writing schedule and holding myself accountable to deadlines that are now feeling um, very real compared to when I was querying and had my own um, own deadlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, BG? Well, there's the writing process and then there's sort of the the follow-up once you have your books done and I find that um Diane maybe you know you're having the same thing there's a lot of um promotion marketing online things that I need to do whether it's website Facebook trying to keep things you know um current or at least you know moving and I find that 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 is something that I've had to develop and I can I try to kind of schedule it in because it's um, it's not particularly productive for me, <laughs> but it's really necessary, I think, mm -hmm. uh, these days, especially in the last couple of years where everything has been um, online anyway. Mm -hmm. As far as writing goes, I find that um, I go through state books go through stages. If I'm really feeling um, that I'm I'm very close to getting a book to work all the way through, I kind of clear out everything in my office, all the counters, and that's all I do. Um, and I try and and work several hours, you know, maybe four hours or so a day, till I feel okay. I've gotten that 
that section or that part done. Um, I dummy all my books to sort of see how they they break up into pages, how the page turns work, how long they're going to be. Um, because for me, and you know, I don't do the illustrations, although there are a couple of books that I'm working on now that I just said, I, I will start to just sketch things in because it helps me. It may, it's not gonna be how the book ends up, but it helps me see sort of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the things, I mean, it, it was, it's a, uh, one of the things I think, you know, we're talking about mentors, and um, working in children's books, I mean, uh, working with Don Freeman, I did, I don't know, five, six, seven books with Barbara Cooney and the Provinces and James Marshall. You, you know, Lane's, you know, I worked with Don Freeman on my very first list and Lane Smith on like by the time I left. I mean, you right. can't imagine, you know, a broader range. Right. And, um, it's hard for me, I can sort of say, oh, well, so-and-so would illustrate it like this way, but it's um, it's helpful, but it also makes it a little harder for me sometimes. You know, I think. Yeah. If I had spent all this time drawing, maybe I could draw my own, but I, I had, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have one last question for the picture book writers, um, a question about um, art notes, illustration notes, do you use them? Uh, how do you feel about them? And maybe we'll start with you, BG, since you have experience um, as an art director. Well, it's interesting because all my editors know I was an art director. They generally, I think, allow me more input. And yeah. But in a manuscript, there's certain things that absolutely I will put in as an art note because I'm not putting in the text because I really try and pull back on um, explaining everything, you know? <laughs> and there are a number of books, you know, some books don't need, I'm, I'm looking at my stack here stuff. Um, and even in the farmer book, I'll say, okay, this could get very boring if it were just da da da, -da back and forth, back and forth. So, um, doing things like showing, you know, a cross section underground and having, you know, fruit different. And I'll, I may, depending on how the book is going, just sketch some of that out. On, on the corduroy books, I work a lot with Jody Wheeler, who illustrates the original or the companion books. And um, very often at this sketch stage, um, they will ask me, to take a look and see, you know, what I think um, would make it be more Don Freeman-esque, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but that's quite unusual. Um, mm -hmm. Generally speaking, I put art notes in and I might put them in for me and my manuscript um, and then, you know, edit them out at a certain point or I will, I, ha I think a couple of times because they're very visual, I'll give them the straight manuscripts and then a second manuscript with art notes, which they can totally ignore if they wish. And I will say that in my note. So this is my thinking, you know, but I know, you know, the art and art, some artists they, who they may want to use may have a totally different approach. Right. And as an author, you have to sort of say it's their name too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I certainly respect that, but that's how I, depends a little on the book, I guess. Right. And how about you, Harshita? And then we'll close with uh, what's coming next from all of you. And then our time will be, we'll be wrapping it up. So illustrator notes first, Harshita. Yeah. I, yes or uh, no? Yes, but not much sparingly. Like if uh, what I'm writing now is not conveying it, then uh, if there is a need for illustration note, like my critique partner, someone say, hey, I'm not understanding what, what mm -hmm. has happened. So I realize, oh, there is a gap and it needs a note. So uh, very sparingly, uh, but not as like, it needs to be blue color or red color because I'm not illustrating. Uh, I don't want to steal their, um, not ideas, but uh, that's their creativity. 
Mm-hmm. So let them make their illustrators make their own story and I do my stuff. So yeah. Very good. All right. So Aiden, what's coming out next from you? Yeah, well, um, I have a young adult uh, dark fantasy novel coming out and uh, I believe it's September or October. Um, oh, right. I believe September. Um, Bone Weaver. It's um, a dark uh, Slavic fantasy loosely modeled after the um, Russian Revolution. Um, and then I have a um, middle grade book coming out in uh, winter of 2023. Um, it's a fantasy um, based on Jewish folklore. Cool. All right, well, look for those. You can drop the titles in the chat if you like. Okay. <laughs> and Harshida. My uh, next picture book is called Cooler Than Lemonade. It comes out next March by Sourcebooks. And uh, it also has uh, food in it, like in this <laughs> one. And it, it also has a recipe in the end, just like this book. But it is completely different. Uh, it is uh, about a girl who's always full of ideas and her persistence uh, uh, for um, uh, she starts a lemonade stand and her persistence as she uh, uh, overcomes all the competition she's getting. <laughs> Great. Uh, all right. And PG, well, anything just, on the calendar nothing, for you? Well, not, not really on the calendar yet. I'm working on a historical fiction book called My Father Paints the Stars, which is uh, really takes, it's sort of family history. My grandfather was an um, artist, a muralist, and painted the sky ceiling at Grand Central Station. Oh my so gosh. there's there is a lot of family lore. My parents' names are up on the ceiling, my uncles and aunts. So it's kind of our family tree, you know, that side of the family. Um, so I've been working on that. Um, autobiographical picture book called Lucy Goose is the Worst Mother in the World, <laughs> um, which I really love the, the, this book, it, and it is autobiographical. Lucy Goose is a perfectionist, and she likes things just the way she likes them, and everything's going just fine until one day, even her nest and one day she wakes up and there are four eggs in her nest. <laughs> Something's wrong. And her, her story of um, how she kind of comes, she's, you know, it sort of ends up, you know, she realizes she, things don't have to be perfect for her to be happy. And she ends up being the happiest mother goose in the world. <laughs> but um, I know I have a lot of little a lot of big projects and little projects that I'm working on. But I, I, I'm sort of like a friend of mine said, it's sort of like an air, you know, Barbara, you're, it's like you're at the airport and you bring this plane up 50 feet and then you go in the next plane 50 feet. Nothing's ever gonna get off the ground. You have to sort of work on one thing, finish it up. We'll see, we'll see. That right. sounds awesome. Uh, we have one question about uh, critique groups at, from Shazia uh, in Arizona. And we do have, I believe maybe Sharon can jump on. I think there's a spot on the AZ webpage from SCBWI um, where people can, um, can request or say that they're looking for someone. Is that right, Sharon? That's correct. So if you go to the SCBWI uh, Arizona website, which is arizona.scbwi.org, there is on the right hand side a link for a critique group list. You can scroll that list and look and see who's already got critique groups there or who's looking. If you don't see what, what works for you, you can email us and the information is on that page to tell you how to email us the information of the critique group that you are looking to be a part of or to start uh, or how you want to approach that. So that is available to you now. We don't do direct critique matching here in Arizona because critique groups are such a, there's such an intimate relationship and need the type of consideration that only those participating can give them. 
but we do provide a place for you to connect with others to see if you're a good fit. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I am inspired. Um, I love the advice that um, to basically keep going, <laughs> believe in yourself, uh, trust, uh, do the writing that is important to you and meaningful to you. And um, so thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, Laura, do you have anything to? Yeah, just to um, just be sure to uh, those of you that, that are attending today, be sure to check out uh, the links and purchase the author's books. Um, Aiden, I'm almost finished with yours and I absolutely love how I'm a big fan of like the, that gothic -y, you know, mystery. So, and I'm all about the dark and I just, I absolutely love it. So um, shout you. out to you. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, please be sure to pick up um, the, all three of these books. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. It's, well, thank um, you. it's so nice to see kind of the variety of books that Arizona authors are creating and um, thank you for spending the afternoon with us and to all the people who joined us. Thank you. And we'll thank look you. forward to getting your books. Thanks so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. All thank you for having me. <laughs> all right.